James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The Bible reads, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in dispersion, greetings. Verse 2, count all joy when you find, when you meet trials of various kinds, you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience or steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We kind of honor that you utilize me as a vessel for your use. I pray, Father, that the words that I speak today will bring life, will bring clarity, will bring wisdom, conviction, but most importantly, change. I pray, Father God, we trust and, and wait well as we wait on you. I thank you, Father God, that you'll grip all of our hearts to see the signs and times, the seasons in which we are in, and to take advantage of them and, 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 and appreciate that grace of, of opportunity, that grace of preparation that, that positions us to be a, a servant that, that can hear the words that will echo on the waiting chambers of heaven, those that phrase of well done. And I thank you, Father, that, that you utilize me as a vessel qualified, not because of my own talents or skill, but because my life is submitted to you. And I pray that the anointing will flow through me like never before, Father, and I appreciate your love for me. With that being said, I come against every demonic spirit, every principality, the witch, every war, anything that may be coming against myself. As I execute the assignment that God asked me, your plots and schemes have been canceled. The word of God will come forth in clarity, in wisdom, and in truth. And with that being said, Father, we thank you for that authority and that it being sealed and active. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's get right into it. What's going on, family? How you doing? Come on in. Come on in. Today we're going to be talking about the effects of not waiting on God or um, ensuring that we, that we uh, uh, receive um, uh, what the season of patience gives us. So let's go right into our premise and then we'll kind of go from there. Our premise, there is a cause for every effect. Nothing happens on accident. Everything has a cause. There is a cause for every effect, and nothing happens on accident. Everything has a cause. Let's look at the definition of effect. Let's look at the noun. A change that is a result of consequence of an action or other cause. A change that is the result or a result or a consequence of an action or other cause. Look at the verb. The verb form of the word effect is to cause something to happen or to bring about. The Bible talks about, it says in verse 4, I believe, it says, and let steadfast or patience have its full effect that it may be perfect and complete so that we may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. And we look at the definition here, it says effect is a change that is a result or consequence of an action or the cause. And every effect that's in you and in my life is due to a cause, that something caused it. If you look at the world that we live in, the world and everything in it, everything was caused by something. Every effect, every one of you, each, and my, each of you and myself, and every person or thing or item was brought about by a cause. Everything negative or positive in your life was brought about because of a cause. What is causing the effects in your life? What is the change that is the fruit of an action, whether knowingly or unknowingly, that's producing the life that you're living? Let's keep going with the problem. There are certain causes or influences we are allowing to affect our lives that are hindering the full effect of patience, causing us to become improperly prepared. There are certain causes or influences we are allowing to affect our lives that are hindering the full effect of patience, causing us to become improperly prepared. We are either experiencing the partial effect or the absent work of patience. There are certain causes or influences we are allowing or letting affect our lives that are hindering the full effect of patience, causing us to become improperly prepared. We are either experiencing the partial effect or the absent work of patience. Each and every one of us are under a cause or influence that is affecting our preparation. The Bible says that we can be complete, whole, and lacking nothing. It doesn't mean perfection. It just means that I'm capable, I'm ready, I'm mature enough to handle God is not looking for people who want to eat from his surplus. He's looking for people who can steward his surplus. 
People who can steward a position. Those who can steward being a husband, steward being a wife, steward being a business woman, a, a businessman or businesswoman who can steward a place. Your level of stewardship is a direct reflection of how you capitalize on your season of preparation. How do you steward your money? How do you steward your family? How do you steward your time? How do you steward your children? How do you steward your idea? How do you steward your time? Your level of stewardship is a direct reflection of you capitalizing on a season of preparation. There are certain causes or influences that we are allowing to affect our lives by hindering the full effect of patience, causing us to become improperly prepared. We are either experiencing the partial effect or the absolute work of patience. Let's go to the next point. Many people are allowing the side effects of their problems, impurities, and pride to have more of a full effect on their lives than the full effects of patience in God's pruning. If it's a run on sentence, please forgive me. <laughs> Many people are allowing the side effects of their problems, impurities, and pride to have more of a full effect on their lives than the full effects of patience in God's pruning. What are you allowing to have more of an effect on your life right now? That's a question you have to ask yourself. We all know what side effects are. Let's look at the definition, and then I'm getting to some points that kind of enhance this. A side effect is a secondary, typically undesirable effect of a drug or medical treatment. A side effect, by definition, is a secondary, typically undesirable, meaning that, hey, I wasn't even expecting this, that my leg falling off, me this pill, taking this pill. I wasn't affected, I, I didn't know that these side effects will come along with this medical treatment. My point here says many people are suffering from the side effects of not adhering to the full effects of patience. Many people are suffering from the side effects of not adhering to the full effects of patience. God has a season, a gracious season, a season by which he implements in your life to give you the opportunity to be prepared, to give you the opportunity to sense and to discern the time that you're in. So many people are not discerning enough, they are not deep enough in their walk with God to understand the time that they're in. They think this is dating season or marriage season or every other season, but they forget that there should be a season of preparation that is my responsibility to go to God and say, God, I lack wisdom, I lack insight. Father, give me the insight that I need to discern the season I am in so that I will step into a place and properly prepare. Right now, God is saying, man, do you trust me in this waiting season? Do, are you going to allow my patience to have a perfect work on you? Or are you going to allow yourself to go up under certain influences that will cause you not to be prepared for what you desire out of this life? I don't want to be a man that wasted my 20s, wasted my 30s, wasted my 40s, and now sit on the front porch of another man's building and say, I wish I would have taken better advantage of the time that I had. A secondary, typically undesirable effect of a drug or medical treatment. Many people are suffering from the side effects of not adhering to the full effects of patience. They're allowing their problems. How many of us lack the wisdom that we need or the perspective that we need to look at our problems and realize they're not really problems? Most of the problems in your life, if they're not self-afflicted, are opportunities. One of the things I tell the children in my school, man, I, and it's sad to hear their stories and to know what they go through. And I know they're at a young age and they're not really ready to receive my essays, my, you know, my wise sayings. <laughs> and when I tell these kids, I say, you know what, this season that you're in right now, what you're going through is building such resiliency that a lot of people who have everything that they have will not be able to stumble in the future. And sometimes when I was growing, many times when I was growing up with God, I used to ask God, why, man? Why am I going through so much? Why, why, why does it seem like it's taking forever? Why does it seem like, you know, I have to wait 10 years? And three, four days ago was 10 years in ministry. And if anybody has even put five, four, or seven, or 10 years in anything, you can understand the beauty of waiting. 
The beauty of understanding that God is going to give you an assignment for you to work on, but he's allowing that assignment to work on you. That if I take my time to embrace what God is doing in my life, I will see the reasons behind the years. But so many of us get so impatient with the gift that God has given us because many of us, we are trying to jump behind the hedge when God is trying to hide us. Some of us are trying to jump into seasons knowing deep inside of ourselves we're not ready. And God is screaming from the heavens, letting us go through signs and through circumstances, through people and through pain, letting you know this is not your time. And it's okay. I know the feelings of anguish. I know the feelings of competition. I know what it's like to look on everybody's Instagram and see what everybody's looking at as if they're doing well, but we don't know what's really going on. We're judging our real life to somebody else's highlights. Everybody posts their best, nobody posts their worst. But if I know that I'm in tune with the Father and I'm staying close to Him, I know for a fact that when this season is done and when it is my season for whatever He wants me to do, I know I will be a steward of that season. What side effects are you facing today? Jumping into relations prematurely, jumping into situations prematurely, finding yourself wasting your years. Let's look at the cause, y'all all right? Some of the causes of us not trusting God's timing. Number one, poor perspectives. Poor perspectives. God cares about how you see a thing. He says, when you see these signs in the heavens, know that I'm coming. It's crazy how many people who follow God don't know the signs. They're not discerning. I, in my walk with God, been walking with him since I was probably six or seven. You know, we count six, seven, you don't know what you're really doing. So say about 17. <laughs> so about time during that phase of my life, to this pinnacle of my place with God, I can look into certain people's lives and say, man, if they only knew. If they only knew that what they're going through is not God punishing them, but preparing them. That if they realize that the cries, I used to cry when I was at 22. You know those times when you walk with God and you have someone ask for advice and you look at them and they be like, you're like, man, no, it's not even that bad. That the pain that you go through, if you really get out of it, it was only a two-month span, three-month span, maybe a year, that you got through it. But it's something about having the proper perspective that you can only get from God's word. His vantage point, his perspective, how he wants things to be, be done is the best point. But many of us don't take time to read God's word and say, God, what is, how do you want me to see this season that I'm in? How do you want me to see this situation? But instead of seeing it as pruning, nobody wants to be pruned. Nobody wants to get go through a, a levels of disciplines, a series of disciplines by, what, by which God prepares us. But man, oh, how sweet are those afflictions. I'm so thankful that he stopped me, pruned me, so now that I can see. Oh, man, do you know how many people just started seeing at 60? <laughs> just now realize what it means to be a man at 40? Just realize what it means to be a woman at 42? Isn't it crazy that it takes us such long periods of time to have the right perspective of a thing? When God said all you had to do was to read my word and see how I handle situations, how I'm commissioning and empowering through the Holy Spirit to handle things. But if you cannot see a thing correctly, you will mismanage it. If you don't know the proper use of a thing, you will misuse it. And God is saying everything that I've created, I have a manual for by which you can learn how to use it. Point number two, problems with processes and procedures. So many people don't want to wait on God, man, because, man, nobody trying to go through another process. <laughs> to, when, when I heard that scripture, to whom much is given, much required, I was like, oh, man, okay. Which, what, what's the required category? It shouldn't be that much. <laughs> oh, man. Whatever you envision yourself, whatever God has placed in your heart, you have to ask yourself, am I willing to go through the process of that thing? People want to be pastors. People want to be evangelists. People want to be business owners. People want to be um, um, husbands and wives, but don't know the process, the prerequisite season to prepare you for that. Like so many people don't want to follow God because it's, it's too much of a process. That There's too much pruning. I don't want to give up. 
And so many of us, we love the prize more than we love the process. We love the gift more than we love the grind. And until you get to a place where you say the process is more valuable than whatever I'm pursuing, you will never be in a place to store that prize when you have it. Processes and procedures. That God is saying, man, there's just certain things we all have to go through in order to manage that season correctly. Pride. We just don't want God. God, I'm going to do it my way. Man, who, who suffered from some young generation, man? But how many of us are suffering the effects that spawn from us walking in our pride? Thinking that we know everything. Not acknowledging God. Your, the fruit of your relationship with God is not predicated on how often you spend time with him during the bad time. It's praying for how often you seek him when times are good. Everybody wants to be a fair weather friend when it comes to God. I mean, a poor weather friend. But nobody wants to be an all weather friend with God saying, God, I'm going to. See, see, <clears throat> the thing about Joseph, I like he said, yes, there's going to be seven years of famine. But we got seven years to prepare for that. When times are good, that's when you should seek God the most. Because if you know anything about life, life always has a way of bringing you back into the valley. Because that's what keeps you humble. That's what keeps you close to him. That's what keeps you in such a place where you say, God, I ain't leaving. I got to a place in my life where I said, God, listen, I ain't leaving. When times start getting good, when blessings start coming, I'm not going to forget you, God. That's easy to say, but it's hard to live out. Some of us, we have allowed our pride to keep us from prospering. Next point, pain tolerance. We don't trust God's season of patience. We don't want to go through it because we know what comes with it. Don't you know <clears throat> that in order to be a soldier in this kingdom, you have to know what pain feels like. Everything in life was birthed out of pain. Every mother in this room and who's watching online can tell you that before a baby comes pain, before any season of promotion, there will be pain. We're not talking about sickness. We're not talking about disease. We're just talking about the pain of being stripped from your idols, the pain of, of your perspective changing, the pain of, of, of realizing abandonment and people not caring about you like you thought. That kind of pain, that pain, that realization when you come to a place where you realize it's really me and God for real. <laughs> Like, everybody else is cute. It's cool to have everybody else. But when it comes down to the get down, it's me and God. And when you strip from your idols, and I tell everyone, there's no greater pain that you and I will feel than being stripped away from the thing we love more than God. And God is always going to touch that thing first. Everything you put before him, he will touch that first. But some of us don't have that pain tolerance. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And in doing that, I think I will escape this pain. But in escaping these light afflictions, which only but for a moment, we find ourselves going into deeper affliction. Affliction that we cause on ourselves. Because we didn't take the time to discern the season that we're in. Last but not least, perverted passions. Poor perspectives. Problems with processes and procedures. Pride, pain, tolerance. And perverted passions. The enemy of our soul wants us to be prideful of this life. He wants us to pursue this world and everything in it versus pursuing the things of God and his kingdom. Always ask young men who ask me questions about marriage. I say, do you even know your position in his kingdom? Do you know the plot by which you're supposed to steward? Do you know the mission behind what ministry is really about? Are you really about advancing his kingdom and building his disciples? Or are you focused on building your brand, which I once I was guilty of? You talking to a man back in the day, I cared about a huge name, not a good name. I cared more about how many seats was in a place versus preaching to people who actually sat in those seats. I was guilty of being a guy that would put gimmicks all around this ministry just to draw people. And I forgot that the same gimmicks you use to draw people is the same gimmicks you have to use to keep people. And then when God humbled your boy and said, all I want you to do is do worksheets and the word of God, then you want to really see my remedy. 
And so many of us can be so caught up on Instagram, celebrity, Christianity, and pastoral ministries by which this Western culture has conjured up that we forget about what it means to really advance his kingdom and build his people. And until we get our minds and, and focused on what it means to really follow him, because everybody has belief, but not everybody has strength in their bones to fall. Oh, man, the Bible says even the devils believe. I don't care about what you believe. I care about, are you following him? And so many of us, we have perverted passions and saying, God, I don't want to deal with your season of preparation. I want this wife. I want this husband. I want companionship. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm sick and tired of this song. Forget. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of going through this. I want this now. Everybody wants it, wants it, but nobody wants to go through the process. Every person has a purpose. Next point. Every person has a purpose. Everyone in this room has one. Everyone watching has a purpose. Every purpose has a series of processes. Every process leads to promotion and requires patience. And every promotion demands protection. When you understand that you have a purpose, you then understand that God is going to put series of processes in your life to prepare you for that purpose. Every person has a purpose, and every purpose has a series of processes. Like I always tell the kids often, I always ask them what they want to be when they grow up. So I'm going to ask you, can I get two or three people to tell them what they want to be when they, well, anyway. Well, what do you envision yourself being? What is, if you were to tell me your purpose, what is that? Anybody want to tell me, two or three people, their purpose? What is their overarching vision and mission for their life? Anyone want to tell me? Yes. Um, my overall mission and vision for my life is to um, be an occupational therapist and mm -hmm. work with um, autistic kids and mm -hmm. um, children with uh, disabilities to help them um, learn better. Good, good. Another person. Anybody else want to share? Let's start with her. <laughs> There's two or three kids in my school that are autistic. Um, and there's a point in our school that we are not in a position to handle them the right way, right? And um, one of those kids' name is Bubba. <laughs> Little Bubba, I tell you, that boy would tear your room up, scream, cry, run all around your room, and five minutes later, you stay out of love. And in trying to communicate with little kindergarten Bubba, you feel that there's a barrier, right? And I used to, and not used to, but when I see kids like that, I'm like, man, like, the old, the old Koji Baptist version of myself want to lay hands. <laughs> but when you're in, a, in an environment where you can, it's something about God putting you in places where you are forced to be patient. Forced. You can't even use him. Forced. Every, I mean, Bubba comes into my office three or four times a day. And I said, God, what are you preparing me for? Everything that is placed in front of me, I ask God, what are you preparing me for? And when God is quiet and when you're faced with situations and God is like, I know there's a theological barrier. I know there's a mental barrier. And you can't even really use me at the moment. You can't even use words at the moment because he can't really process. But it's something about the places that he has us that builds a deeper empathy, a deeper grace, a deeper patience. That only comes from processes. Oh, you have young people, man. They bless their hearts. When it's time for the ministry, Everybody wants to do and start a ministry, right? People want to start a business. They love starting. Don't get intoxicated with the celebrations that come from when you start. Everybody surrounds you when it's time to, for the baby reveal. Everybody's there when, when, when you at the, what's, what y'all ladies do when y'all get engaged? Engage? Y'all do it. Y'all do it so much. Um, engage? <laughs> engage? Anyway. Everybody's there for the launch of a business. There when you are in the middle of it. And 
so many people rush to these places of influence, not knowing that God wants you to be a man or woman above reproach, not knowing that you got to have a certain level of character to withstand all temptation. Just because you get married doesn't mean every woman becomes ugly and every man becomes as dumb. And everybody is still who they are. And when you find yourself in a level of, of operation, a level of position, you got to understand that you got to be built up with something. So many people want to be in, in where, 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 where everything is great, but they don't have enough foundation in them. Whatever your purpose is, if you don't know, not only will God show you what you're going to do, but he's going to say, sweetheart, young man, here are some processes that's going to be painful. Here's a season of patience I'm allowed. If you allow it, her perfect work will formulate you into a man or a woman that will walk in humility but will speak with power you will be effective, you will be skillful, because when you trust me in this season of preparation, when it's, stand, when it's time for you to stand on your platform, you will be so heavy and anointing, so heavy with me back you, that no demon, no principality, no king or president can stop you at that moment. But so many people want to speak out before their time and get their heads cut off like John the Baptist. We got to get to a place where we know our purpose, and we humble ourselves upon this process that God prune me. Oh man, I know my purpose. I know I'm called to the nations. I know, I know that there's a heavy anointing on my life. And I've got to respect that. How can you respect an anointing you don't know you have? How can you respect a purpose you don't know you have? Demons, it's crazy how many demons, how demons know more about us than we do. They are so effective in keeping you from knowing you that you they can go, they can go two or three weeks without bothering because they know you will humble yourself up under cycles of torment, that you will allow perverted passions, pride, ego to cause you not to even focus. But that's why I tell everyone when they come to me, Josh, when I started reading my Bible faith, when I started praying, oh man, I started getting attacked. That's you darn right. <laughs> because when you know you're going into the right, you know you're going in the right direction when you feel resistance. No resistance, you're going the wrong way. But when you focus yourself on God and you know who you are in Christ, and you know how to counsel their plots and schemes, you know how to flow in the Spirit, no matter where you find yourself as far as processes, you will begin to fall in love with the process because you know the process is making you into a better person. Every promotion, uh, uh, every purpose has a per every person has a purpose. Every purpose has a series of processes. And every process leads to promotion and requires patience. Every promotion demands protection. Let's keep going. I got a lot more notes. Nothing is sustained without the proper perspective and processes of patience. Nothing is sustained. If I don't have the right perspective on marriage and I'm not willing to be patient, I will be the cause to fall up. Um, can you repeat that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing is sustained without the proper perspective, proper perspectives and processes of patience. Let's get to what I really want to get to today, and we'll have discussion and QA. <clears throat> right, let's go to the transition. Everyone is up under a cause and are producing the effects. What is causing the effects? In your life. Let's go to the first box. Unique causes and influences most people are under. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, twelve. Unique causes and influences most people are under. You and I are up under one of these influences at the moment. Number one, cultural. Cultural causes. Cultural. An effect is a change in the result or consequence of an action or the cause. That right now, there are certain effects in your life that will spawn from a cause. And some of those effects are based upon cultural causes. Culture. What culture do you glean from, learn from, grow from? What is that culture? Culture is that thing by which you formulate your values, principles, ideologies, Actions, mindset, culture. 
even within Christian culture, there are subcultures that are dangerous. What do you watch? What do you listen to? What do you engage in the most? Who are your influencers? Who are the spokespeople of your life? The artists of your soundtrack? The people who are ingratiated in the culture that you selected to be up under. We live in such a divided season of our country where people are either pro-black, pro-white, pro-Hispanic, pro-Native American, pro-Republican, pro-Democrat. Everybody has a side. But it's crazy how we make sub-components of ourselves our first point of our banner. I am not a black man first. I am not a Nigerian first. I'm a Christian first. So you have certain people who will pick their political party and their skin color before they actually harbor in their heart what it means to be a Christian first. So when I understand that, I don't, like, you'd be asking me, are you Kojic, are you Demo not Democratic, but Democrat or Republican, they'd be asking me, are you Reformed, are you Calvinist? I'm like, listen, I'm just a follower of Jesus. I don't even want no title, because if I give you a title, you put me in a box, and it affects everything that I want in my life. Therefore, the only culture I go by is the kingdom of God, period. That's what my goal is. And sometimes that's, a, that's an everyday thing. You gotta, sometimes you find yourself in certain days where you find yourself really in your culture. But you have to say, first off, before I go to the Breakfast Club, or before I go to um, Joe Budden podcast, before I go um, to what ESPN is saying, before I go to hear what Skip and Shannon got to say, before I go there, before I go, before I go anywhere, let me go here first. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we want to just be on the cutting edge of culture, or we want to be able to be a part of the conversations in the lunchroom that we ingest and digest all these different things, and we wonder why we have colon cancer spiritually. Constipated because we have all this stuff that your spirit man can't process. And we've given ourselves all this poor nutrients and we wonder why our souls are so obese. Your body ain't the heaviest person of you. Some of us, we're more heavy in our souls than we are in our bodies. We got all this junk weighing us down because we want to be a part of culture. I don't care who the president is, I know who Jesus is. I don't care about who it is, who is that. Listen, I don't care. I care to a degree, don't get me wrong. But it'll keep me up at night. Because I gotta be about my father's business. Because some of us are gonna find ourselves in a place where we know more about culture and what's going on than we know about what God wants us to do today. Every day God has an assignment for you and I. But many of us will allow these cultural influences or causes to produce some certain effects in our lives. That now we're going back and forth on Twitter about who the president, what the president did, what this happened. We're going back and forth about LeBron and MJ. We, <laughs> all this is just becoming kind of extreme. That many of us forgot that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And even in casual conversation, we can find ourselves subjected to a demonic influence, keeping us from discerning deep personal causes. Personal, mental, and emotional. Some of us, a lack of discipline is the, are causing some of the effects in our lives. Personal issues. <clears throat> Every time I do something where I know I did it wrong, I take note of it. Because to a degree, I'm responsible for my growth. I can't sit there and know I did something wrong or not did it as efficient as I needed to, and not try to implement a system or discipline to ensure that when I face this again, I succeed. I don't want to be the reason why I didn't succeed the way God desired for me to. I don't want myself to be in, in mental, emotional turmoil for, for any period of time, keeping me from being effective. What are those character flaws in your life right now that's keeping you from actually flowing to a level of stewardship by which God can honor you? We all have character flaws. Man, people got the same attitude since 1988. <laughs> and you know the old folks, but I'm just stuck in my way. Man, listen, 
Why? Why you want to be stuck in that way and that way has kept you from succeeding this whole time? Nobody wants you to look out. Nobody wants your potatoes out. Nobody wants you around because you, you're just stuck in your way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is we got to look inside of ourselves and say, what am I doing that's causing me to have these effects in my life? Emotional strain, weight gain, spiritual depletion. What am I doing? Eating, experiencing, engaging in, that's keeping me from executing at a high level that, man, ain't, ain't it beautiful when you find yourself at your healthiest, if you find yourself at your most peaceful place where you actually can effectively be effective, <laughs> that you can actually be used? Right now, I guarantee you, for the last part of this year, we just say, you know, for the next two months, I'm just going to focus on improving the small things in me. What are those small things that spoil in your mind? You've heard this many times. They said little foxes spoil the vine. Well, back in those days, they had fences that protected their vines. So the big foxes couldn't get to them. The fence was too high. It was protecting the fruit. But the fence wasn't enough to protect the vine. That the most important part of the plant is not the fruit. It's the vine. The little fox was able to get up under the fence and bite the vine. That it ultimately, over time, affected the fruit. It's those little things you overlook that causes the biggest damage. The biggest damage in your life was nothing big. It was something small you overlooked. And if you keep overlooking the small things that are screaming in front of you, change, 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 they will catch up with you. Carnal causes. That's the kind of goes with personal karma. Sin. Carnality. Just doing what we want in our flesh. The Bible says the flesh knows no good thing. The flesh knows what it wants. It's our responsibility through the leading of the Holy Spirit to discipline that flesh to the point to where we're not allowing ourselves to be influenced through culture, through anything, to become carnal. There's two people living in you right now. Your carnal self or your renewed self. Which one is living strongest in your life? It's crazy how many of us kill our renewed self or the opportunity to become renewed more than we do our carnal self. Every day we got to say, you know what, am I allowing sin, habitual sin in my life, or ignorance or negligence to cause certain effects in my life? Abnormal causes. Abnormal is another word for that is demonic. I had to find, I had to find some for demons, so abnormal, A-L, I found that normal for it. Abnormal. We're not supposed to be so caught up in who our enemy is, but you better respect your enemy. Anybody who's been in boxing, been in any kind of sport, knows that if you don't respect your opponent, but they're talented, you will get beat, even if you're more talented. Satan hasn't been redeemed and will not be redeemed. Therefore, we are the golden state to them, right? So we're actually the strongest individuals. We actually the ones that if we actually get the Holy Spirit of God, can actually defeat them at every single end. But when we do not know who we are in Christ, and we don't understand what it means in following Christ and the effects that come from that, I'm telling you, you start following God, there will be some abnormal effects that happen in your life to weaken your faith. They know you are a threat to your family. If you get saved, you have the power to be an influence so dense enough to get your whole family saved. So they know, what can I do abnormally in their life to get them to stop praying, to stop fasting, to stop seeking God so that we can sleep good at night knowing that we don't got to worry about them walking in power. Demons, all they got to do is say, okay, where in their life are they their weakest? Demons don't attack me straight up. Let me just, let me just, this is how they do with me. They don't attack me straight up. Because they know, they know that I know. But what they used to do, they started attacking my mom, siblings, my wife. Well, back then she was a girlfriend. You know what I'm saying? They'll try to attack in certain angles. Because they know if I can't get to him straight on, I'm going to get to what has his heart. So when I start flipping the game, I say, you know, I'm starting to clean the blood over everyone, covering everyone, so they can't really get no entrance. 
But when you are not aware and, 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 and deep in your spiritual walk and know how to cover your loved ones and cover your property where they can't get an entrance, you're going to find yourself in all kind of abnormal things happen in your life. You're like, why do I got this pain in my back? But they just want your mind off focus. Because if I can get you in abnormal causes and you get caught up in wrestling against flesh and blood, you get caught up in old sinful habits, you just get spun around and sent away, I don't have to worry about you cause and effects in the demonic world. Neutral, neutral causes. These are your procrastinators. These are people that don't be doing nothing. They just neutral. Indecisive. Halt between two opinions. Confused. Neutral causes. They want us to be so neutral where we just cost them. You don't want to be that kind of believer where you're just stuck in the middle. You ain't picked the side. You're confused. Neutral. Next point, lateral. Cultural, personal, carnal, abnormal, neutral, and lateral. Lateral influence of causes are people on your level. People lateral. Things that's in your life just lateral. So many of us are affected by the people in our lives. Lateral causes. Bringing certain people in our lives that when they speak into our life or when they leave our lives, they drastically affect us. I said this many times. This one thing that changed my life. Give people your love. But don't give people your heart. It's a difference. So many of us, we give our hearts to everybody. Like, that thing is just free. <laughs> like, anybody can handle it. We were not designed to just give everyone the deepest parts of ourselves. We were just sent to love. But when you allow all these people laterally in your life, things begin to affect you. Experimental. 15 more minutes and I'm out your way. Experimental. These are people who just don't want to listen to counsel. They just want to do what they want to do. Seekers. Man, there's two classrooms you're going to learn from in life. Either the classroom of experience or the classroom of observation. You choose. <clears throat> a smart person learns from their experiences, but a wise person learns from the experiences of others. It's smart to learn from experience. What do you do? You learn. But a wise person, I'm going to watch all y'all jack y'all lives. And then I'm going to learn from that. <laughs> you don't have to experience certain things to know that it's wrong or right. It's called discernment. Discernment is a gift that the Holy Spirit will say, yay or nay. <clears throat> He'll say, no, that ain't it for you. But then what we do, but why? You want to get to a spiritual walk, place with God where you're able to just say, okay. But most of us, and I've been guilty of you, like, man, why? But why? I guarantee you, every person you've dated, for those who married, y'all can y'all can attest to it. Every person you thought was the one, you heard that no. But you didn't want to listen. Or you don't grieve him so much that he was like, I ain't talking to you because you ain't gonna listen. But many of us, if we really took the time and we can all the way look back and say, you know what, he warned me. There is not a person on this planet. Who is absent of divine warnings. Whether you're atheist, whether you're Christian, whether you're gay, whether you're straight. Because you know why God always gives warnings? So that if you die, you can't accuse him of not warning you. In order for God to be just, he has to be omniscient, he has to be all-knowing. Means he has to be omnipresent, he has to be everywhere. Means he also has to be omnipotent, means all-powerful. In order for him to be a righteous judge, he has to place eternity in all of our hearts so that we are aware that there is a God. Whether you want to believe there's a God or not, he's saying, man, listen, I don't got to play peeky boo with y'all. Y'all know from the trees out here. You know from the clouds that I exist. Why would God waste his time trying to prove to people he's real? Because even if God tried to prove that he was real, it will not change the hardness of people's hearts. People are like, oh, cool, you real, but I still don't want you. So until we get to a place where we understand it, we'll say, you know what? I'm not going to be that type of person that wants to experience life so much that I remove myself from experiencing you. 
what got us here in the first place? If Adam would have just taken a walk with God in the cool of the day, would we be in? If he was actually available, accessible, there versus being consumed with the gift that he was given, so many of us, so many of us are so exper experimental. We know God is telling us no, we want to do it anyway. Vocal, vocal calls. Some of us are living our lives off of the words of someone else. What your mama told you at 13, you still living with that pain in your heart now. What your dad didn't say, you still living off the effects of what he didn't say. Some of us have allowed false doctrine vocally to cause effects in our lives. The number one voice that should be the loudest and immediately obeyed or considered is the voice of God. Do you know his voice? He says, my people know my voice, and my sheep know my voice, and the stranger, they will not fall. Are we following the Savior, or are we following strangers? What they tell kids, stranger danger? <laughs> stranger danger. Whatever stranger you follow, you will eventually find yourself in danger. Every word that comes in your mind, if it doesn't compare itself to the word of God, you have to take it captive immediately. You know you can arrest thoughts, but how can you arrest a thought when you don't know that thoughts, what that thought is coming against? If I don't know what the word of God says about me, as soon as someone says something about my hairline, when the kids be coming at my hairline, and back in the day that would have hurt me because I wanted that hairline. Back when you know, 25, 26, the waves was in the back of the day. Everybody cared about the waves. I ain't know I had the right head for a bald head. I was like, look, you went bald six years, seven years ago. But when them kids, man, <laughs> come at the hairline, you be wanting to clap back, like, why are you clapping back for? You know, you be, because they talk junk, they talk junk you like an adult. So you want to clap back like an adult, but you can't. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Vocal. Next point, biological. Some of us do to what we eat, drink, and do in our bodies, our cravings are causing the effects in our lives. Biological. What habits have you been practicing that's causing your body to have biological causes that cause you to have certain effects in your life? Emotional eating, depression, poor eating, not working out. What are those things that's causing those Biological effects in life that's causing you to have other effects in life. Habitual. Some of us are under habitual causes. Generational curses. Habits from somebody else and habits of our own. People are like, how does a generational curse pass by? It passed by through observation. When your mama put all that salt on her chicken, you say, well, I'm going to put salt on my chicken. <laughs> you know, then you got loud, and you got salt. And the next thing you know, you got high blood pressure like your mama because you observed. You was around alcoholism as a, with your dad, and some of us, you, some people adhere to that influence and follow through. Some of some people did, but you are the direct reflection of what you observe as a role model. Man, listen, <clears throat> I didn't care what my father used to do. I can't let it pass. What are those habits that you have formed in your life, whether it's through? demonic lineages, through, through demonic persuasions, or through just your own sparking of a generational curse. I don't want to pass a lust addiction or pornography addiction or uh, competitiveness or pride at Nigerian pride. I don't want to pass that down. That thing has to stop here. You have the responsibility to say this stops here because your kids are going to watch you. They want to observe you. And if you still practice certain sins in the house of your children, you're giving that demon legal right to, to influence your children to follow your hidden sins. They may not know what you're really doing, but you get a clearance for that demon to occupy that house so that when your son becomes 13, he falls in the same sin again. People tend their businesses and their ministry more than they tend their families. I promise her that I'm not going to allow how 
big a name I would like to have or how big I want this ministry to be to make me run over my family. That's why I streaked it down. I said, I can't be preaching all the time. And I know I got nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters and people. I don't want to be saving the world and my family dying. That's an order of tending. People want to tend somebody else's field, but don't want to tend their own plot. And God is not going to judge you based upon how many nations you impact. He's going to go, how's your son doing? Mm. You know, God always asks a question with a question. He'll be like, so how's your son? Adam, I mean, who told you he was naked? Adam, where are you? He's not asking questions because he doesn't know. He's asking questions so that you can know. And that's why you got to understand that God does things in decency and in order. That if your ministry is bigger and more successful than your family, you're not really doing ministry. If your business is bigger and more effective and prosperous than your family, you ain't really successful. God does not measure success off of the world's terms. He measures it off of his. What do you care about most? What is your heart setting you up for? Because if you get so caught up in what success in this world space is, you'll forget about what it means to be a part of, to advance, and to advance the kingdom of God. And the last two are the most important. Biblical and vertical, and beneficial causes. I want to speak life. I want to speak the word of God. Because in speaking it and in living it, it will cause effects onto my life that will be beneficial. Confessing the word, trusting the word, reading the word, spending time with God, worshiping, having a biblical mindset, having a biblical worldview, having a biblical understanding, having a biblical divine connection with the Father, that thing will cause effects on your life. But some of us, we don't want those effects. We don't want internal effects. We want external effects. God, I'm only going to come to you because I want that Bentley truck. God, I'm only going to be right because I want a husband. I want a wife. God, give me something externally to prove that you love them. God said, man, I ain't, I ain't really trying to give you that. I'm trying to give you love, joy, peace. Like, do you know me? I'm telling you, you can't put a price on my peace. The moment I feel anyone or anything jeopardizing my peace, you cuts off. <laughs> peace of mind is special. The joy of the Lord, that's special. Knowing real love, that's special. Seeing the effects of being long-suffering, is being gentle, being kind. Like <clears throat> Those things is what gets you the external things. It's those things that gives you favor. It's those things that make it. Listen, if you can't suffer long, anything, how can you attack? How can you ever get to a place of success? If you ain't joyful, how, how can the rich and kings be drawn to you? Can you imagine the peace that's on, that was on Daniel? The meekness that was on Joseph? The strength and the joy that was on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Pharaohs inquired them. Kings want to know about but if we get to a place where we want the king's armor, we want to bow down for 20 minutes <clears throat> so that we won't get killed or we'll stop praying because I'll be in a lion's den. Listen, when you faithful to God and you stand on that word, you don't know what miracles you're going to see. So many of us, we compromise so much that we'll never see the salvation of the Lord in areas where the world can be changed. You mean to tell me that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was really thrown in the fire at first? And did him burn. All those people that bowed down, they felt a certain kind of way. <laughs> oh, snap. You know. Are you really in love with God's word to such a degree where you say, God, enrich me with the word of God. Put me into a place where I hunger and thirst after your righteousness. Inspire me, oh God. God, lead me in the path of righteousness. God, strengthen me. Help me understand that I welcome your processes. God, prune me, shape me, 
mold me because I want to be complete. I want to be whole. I don't want to lack all the days of my life. I want to be prosperous for your kingdom. I want to be effective. I want to be efficient. I want to be, I want to be a man that you, listen, I, I, my heart for God is so strong. I'd be like, God, I want, I want what you and Enoch had. I want that kind of relationship. I want what you be like, man, Josh, I about took you four times. I want that kind of love of God because I don't want to get to heaven and God be like, we could have had something done. But you allow all these causes to bring all these effects in your life. And now you're stuck in cycles of condemnation and sin. And you wasted your 20s and 30s. And I want to help you, but I'm like, now I've got to help your two daughters and your son. Now I gotta help you with this because now I'm giving you joy for not not, for not necessarily consequences, not bad things, but because of things that you brought in your life. Now we gotta clean this up. Now we gotta help this. But thank God that no matter what mistake you make, He can redeem it. But man, please don't give Him fifty things more to redeem. At least stop today and say, you know what, God, I'm gonna stop all carnal. Cultural, personal, abnormal, neutral, lateral, experimental, vocal, biological, habitual causes that is spawning these negative effects in my life. I'm looking at two boxes. I know we went for an hour. Any questions so far? If not, I can cover the other two boxes. If not, I have some questions. Any questions so far to what we discussed? Concerns? Comments? If not, we go into the process of Satan and calls, so I can talk about the effects of trusting his process. So I can talk about our final thoughts of what you should let, watch what you let affect your life during your season of preparation. Mm -hmm. Could you be more transparent of it? Give like three examples of the attacks that will come through your mind. <coughs> like worry, like like weird anxiety out of nowhere. Um, <coughs> mental torments on them. Like they know that when you're the go-to person spiritually, they know who to go to when they go through the abnormal demonic stuff. And so it's, it's, it's occupying your prayer time. It's taking off your focus when, when your mom calls and she got abnormal pain in her side. And now you're thrown off like, man, she got this, or she got to get that. Like, so all of a sudden your mind's thrown off. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And when I used to stay with her and she went through her high blood pressure moments and and, and she went through different things. You had to watch her cry because of what she's going through. It affects you. You know what I'm saying? And so it could just be just life that, that a person is going through. And sometimes just things that you don't really have to tell me at this moment. It's crazy how stuff you will go through stuff and they, demons know you're going through stuff. But they know, let me add some extra load to that. By adding your mama's cares, your woman's cares, your family's cares, you're thinking about your brother, your sister done called you the other day, the other day, but months ago, talking about she's going through depression. That stuff weighs on you. When you still got to work on a message, in the middle of writing a book, <clears throat> you're about to get married. It's, it's, it, when, when you got 50 tabs open in your mind, mm -hmm. they love opening new tabs. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they want to get you into a place where you're processing 10 things at one time. And they know burnout is with moments, days, or weeks away. Because they know they can't kill me straight up, but they know they can let, how can I get them to hypertension? How can I get them to diabetic? How can I get them in this place where he, through his big heart, cares so much, loses peace, loses sleep, and then maybe can get him dead by 30. When you know that their objective, based upon your level of anointing, is not to just slap them, but they want me dead. And when you know demons want you dead, you kind of got to process things a little bit more spiritually. You got to be smarter. Go ahead. Oh, okay. And also, like, do you think um, it's too legalistic as far as music, just not listening to any worldly music, just straight gospel? What is your uh, perspective on that? Yeah, my perspective on that is just simple, man. Like, not all, let me, let me make it plain um, and, and more effective. When you know the industry, you know who Satan was over music, right? And you understand that he wants worship. And when you hear and know that they are putting satanic and demonic curses on these songs, mm -hmm. it's not the words, even the beat have power. Mm -hmm. You be looking at this kid, shoot, shoot, like what, 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 you don't even know what shoot really is. We don't know if it's a curse, we don't know what it is. We don't know juju. What's juju on the beat? What is juju? What is 
Like, what are these melodies that kids are saying? We don't know what these things are. So when I used to be, this is back in the day, when I used to ride my, I used to pick my sister up for Unplugged. And, and, you know, my kind of heart was like, I don't want to put no Kirk Franklin man. <laughs> like, you know, I don't want to put my Hill song on because I'm trying to reach my family. Yeah. And they put on power in it, and my spirit just felt like, yeah. they are not mature enough to discern the frequencies, the demonic frequency that is passed by. Like, like, why are these people so obsessed with these artists? Why are they so loyal? Like, do you not know that even certain pastors know how to practice hypnotism in their congregation? What? They know how to practice. I mean, you know what I'm saying? All churches will do this. Now, listen to me clearly. Some people adopted certain lifestyles, not lifestyles, but certain practices that they may not even know could be demonic. Why do they always play the keyboard when it's time for uh, great results? There's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But some people will manipulate that to conjure up certain responses. People don't, churches don't really, not all churches, some churches don't care about conversion. They just care about that tithe getting passed in. So I'll do whatever I can to get you into this hyper state of emotionalism to the point where now church becomes your high. So all of a sudden, every Sunday, you're just coming to get high, but you're not coming to get changed. Because if I truly teach the word of God, you ain't going to really want to come here on Sunday. You don't really want to hear truth, but if I make you feel comfortable, if this is, if, and why do you think they call it experiences now? Like, like, we're not saying, I'm not saying church who say it's wrong, I'm not saying it, but you got to understand, could it have been passed down by something else to dilute the power of what church really was meant to be? So when it comes to gospel music, when it comes to secular music, it's all about the heart of the individual. The words of the individual, the heart of the individual, the, in, the intent. Man, we were just talking about an artist, I'm going to say his name. Man, that, those first two albums, man, I was on my floor crying. You couldn't tell me that album was anointed. Listen to his album now, ain't the same. Oh. <laughs> the reason why I don't say names, I'm put you on, the reason why I don't say names is because I don't want to disqualify myself from reaching that person. A lot of people will be talking about these people, you just disqualify yourself from even being used to reach them. As long as everyone has air in their lungs, they can be redeemed. So why say their name ain't God? I'm like, oh, you know, they watch this video, then I can't even use you. I don't say no names. I just focus on making sure my name is up under his name. And if I do that, I'm good. So when it comes to music, there's just certain things you might just stay away from. There's certain people who don't love God, who don't care nothing about God, they use, they use God's name in vain, and they put demonic frequency on these songs. I promise you, you listen to certain, if you see some effects in your life right now, it could be the result of some of the music that you listen to. I used to be the type of guy, not even reading, maybe two or three years ago, you know, I was, in a, I was in a weird space in my life, man. I was just like, man, do I want to do ministry anymore? So, I, you know, um, I would start listening to, I would listen to on the side, like some of the Drake stuff. I used to listen to uh, Jay-Z. Because I, was, I got caught up in that space where entrepreneurship was the focus. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, bump this ministry, let's get this money. Mm -hmm. And so even when Diddy came out with that uh, Money Making Bitch, that song had that entrepreneur feel to it. Um, some albums had entrepreneurs, and I found myself adopting the spirit of that album. And when I realized that, man, this thing is causing damaging effects in my life, now I'm becoming arrogant. Mm. Now I'm becoming like, uh, I started quoting deep, uh, Drake's lyrics. I would say stuff like, you know, first name, last name, uh, <laughs> what's, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Last name, last name, greatest, like first name. Yeah. yeah, like a spray ankle ain't nothing to play with. Like, I, I got in that pride. I'm like, I'm the best out here. Got some up. And it's like, man, if you're not careful, mm -hmm. you will adopt the spirit that is inspired. And when you start hearing Jay-Z and Eminem saying in their documentaries that they went to that Rain Man, and you, talk, you hear people talking about Sasha Fierce, and you hear about, uh, what's her name, talking about Roman, uh, Nicki Minaj, and everybody got these alter egos. They ain't alter egos. are demons. Mm -hmm. They are not that good. <clears throat> The only way you can be good on this planet is to be, the only way you're good and really, really good is if you got demons working behind you or the Spirit of God working behind you. Beyonce said in one of her interviews, she was like, I ain't really that good. I don't like dancing in front of people. When Sasha comes in, now all of a sudden she's dancing and she's looking crazy and she's going, and she's effective. They need them demons. They need, they, they can't make, listen, that's what I'm saying, man. Listen, these people do love these demons and they love not think they love that lifestyle, 
There's a price that comes with that. Oh, yeah. But when you walk with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be like, you know what? You're just not ready yet. So when it comes to these artists, I just say stay away from them. And there's going to be some gospel artists. You know what I mean? This gospel music mm -hmm. is so homosexual. You know, you look at some of these artists, I can't even watch the Stella Award. I can't watch because you're usually like, man, what is coming over music from a strong place? When you go deeper in your discernment, you can look at things and say, it ain't right. I look at certain priests, I'm like, why are you dressing that way? Why are you walking that way? Why do you have those mannerisms? Why are you doing that? Why are you mimicking? Why? And it's like, you know what? I'm just going to stay with God. And don't listen to nothing. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean, the Holy Spirit let you know when you engage with him, you'll be like, that, that's good, that's not good. But on, the only way you can know and decipher what's best for you is if you go deeper to God for yourself. Any other questions? Yes. How do you get to that place, sir? Like you want to know more. You want to. You want to. You want that. You want to raise your awareness within yourself. How do you get to that place to get in a deeper relationship? Let's break that down. That's a very, very important question. <clears throat> Stillness. Mm -hmm. Removing every influence. Sometimes you can listen to preachers so much. And I even tell people watch me online. People who binge watch my stuff. I'm like. Don't do it because now I automatically become this, this, this spiritual vocal person. So when you read it, Coach Josh would say this. Mm -hmm. Or my pastor would say this. <clears throat> or look what my pastor said. So you have to remove almost all influences. Saying, I'm not going to watch YouTube. I'm going to listen to no preaching. I'm just going to get this Bible. Yeah. I'm going to still do my day. I'm going to go to this. what you do. This is what you do. If it's social media, remove your internet, remove your data. If it's TV, cut the cable off. Wake up, brush your teeth, wash your face. You gotta do that. Find a place where you can meet with God every day. You sit there, and what you do, what I do, <clears throat> and what I did to get that discernment deeper was to read a proverb a day and a gospel a month. I keep it very simple. A proverb a day will give you those wisdom nuggets to apply in your life. So what you do is you get a notebook. And whatever scripture sticks out to you in that, you just write it down. And what I do, I don't just read my Bible as a regiment. I don't do that. I sit there and I do what the kids do to me. Mr. Ed, can you read this book to me? I can't go nowhere down the hall. Mr. Ed, I got a book. When it's reading time, can I read to you? They don't necessarily want me to read to them because... They want to be better than reading. They just want that relationship. So when I go to my Bible, I say, Holy Spirit, read this to me. And when I'm reading, just my casual reading, I'll get stuck on the scripture. That certain scripture just can't get past. Like, man, okay, okay, okay. Let me sit still. Let me see what the scripture is saying. Holy Spirit, what are you trying to show me in this? When you practice that rhythm of acknowledging in all your ways, trust me with all your heart, lean not to your own attention in all your ways, acknowledge him, you will direct your path. That's how your discernment deepens when you're able to say, Holy Spirit, what are you showing me here? So I, I deepen my discernment by just deepening my fellowship. Saying, okay, what are the top five things that influences you right now? They can say, maybe I watch too much TV, maybe I'm on Instagram too much. Get rid of all of that and just get back to the raw. When I drive to work, I don't play nothing. I start praying in tongues, right? I start praying to God. I make myself sensitive. People will say, well, then what's praying in tongues? The Bible says talk about praying in tongues edifies the spirit, it strengthens you. Mm -hmm. People get so caught up, well, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. Well, you must not be sensitive. You don't want to strengthen yourself. You don't want to position yourself to be sensitive. So all 40 to 50% of my day is focused on him. That's possible. You go to the bathroom at break time. You go eat your lunch. You don't got to eat with everybody. You give your eight hours to the man, you give your eight hours to your job, and you come home and give the rest of your time to him. Eight hours sleep, eight hours on the job is 16 hours, right? 7 to 8 to 19, 20 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. That means we all have eight extra hours. We don't eat no four hours. So you take about another hour off from eating or whatever. You go to the gym. All that extra time can be utilized in just spending time with him, right? I hope that makes sense. You want more practical things? 
All right, get the notebook, get a notebook from uh, Walmart today. Just get you a good old Bible, ESV standard, uh, even the ESV version is a good version. I'm talking about ESV study Bible, you want to get a good study Bible. What you do is you just go right now, going from all the way from Genesis from the beginning, but that's your goal, so you want to do that, because you get the Leviticus, you're going to be messed up in there. <laughs> so you, know, you, start, you start with Proverbs today, and you get a gospel. When you went, like right now, I'm um, um, in John, right? You in John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what you do is, it's November, you can start with Matthew. Then December's Mark. January, Luke, et cetera, et cetera. Add Acts in there. What that does is, with the gospel, it shows you Jesus and how he handles situations. The more you looked unto him, the more you begin to become like him. The more you be like, man, he really didn't, he's not really a judgmental guy. He wasn't partial. Look how he handles certain situations. But you begin to look at what the uh, commentary says about certain things. Because that brings, that brings like curiosity. Like what does, why was Martha so busy? Why was Martha mad at Mary? Why? What makes it, man, I'm telling you, you be, so, you be in your study with God, you be like, man, when you realize culturally that when you was a prostitute, you didn't go to the well with the other women, which means that every prostitute or sinning person went to the well at noon, at the heat of the day. So you mean to tell me Jesus was willing to sit in the heat for one woman? That, oh man, that makes you want to dive deeper and be like, I want to know the real reason behind everything. And in time, you're like, man, I am really in love with the Word of God. And you'll become more sensitive. Get your notebook. Start reading John. Start reading Proverbs. Whatever scripture hangs out, you write it down. And you always ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? You set a climate of worship wherever you are. Which means... What I used to do before I got married was, I used to have my iPad out. I let worship music play in my house the whole time while I'm at home, while I'm at work. Come in there and you feel this density. You know where I got that from? When I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I, was in, and I wasn't able to get back on campus, so the, the pastor allowed me to stay in one of their um, missionary homes, right? I walked in that place. The Spirit of God was so heavy in that place. I said, why so heavy? And God said, we leave worship music on day. Because now you tell every demon why you go on this place is holy. Mm -hmm. And when you come into that environment, you can't help but saying, God, I love you. Little changes like that will deepen your relationship will make you sensitive, where you're able to see the truth of something. Does that make sense? Yes. I got a video on I sent it to you. Make sure you get your email. Mm -hmm. I ain't had no really, you know, you know get a little disorder. You know what I'm saying? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, to, to add to that, you have the Proverb a day, you got 31, 30, 31 mm -hmm. month, uh, days in a month, so that's one proverb a day, one proverb, one proverb. and you have every five months a gospel, because you added that to that, so a gospel, and, that. and then um, within that month, that covers the whole month, one gospel, and then a proverb a day, and so I guess what what is what else are you feeding your spirit? Is it just maybe whatever it is that your pastor or your the mission of your church at the time. That's where you're coming from. Um, is there anything else? Because there's got to be more than just that. Yeah, so it's in the beginning. So in the beginning, you're trying to find yourself back to the fundamentals. These are just like the, just the fundamentals. Help you become the whole, once you become sick, it's almost like detox. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you detox your body, all of a sudden now you're in a clean slip. All right. So once you detox yourself spiritually, like I know the word of God for myself, I'm engaged with it, I'm in love with it, I'm rightly dividing the word of truth myself. I'm, I'm actually in this thing, then you become a trinity where all the spirits going to be like, okay, now you can listen to this person again. But there's some of us up under so much spiritual, pastoral influences that we're subjected to false doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, when the, when the apostles came to these people and they preached the gospel and stuff, the Bereans went back and said, you know what, cool, I like what you said, but I'm going to go back home and find out for myself. Yeah. That's the type of believer you need to be to be successful. But that doesn't mean you leave a church because you found out that your past said one thing wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like people can talk, people be witch hunting. I'm like, man, just because a man said something wrong, people want to go where their emotions are. They don't want to go where God wants to send them. Do you think Joseph really wanted to serve Pharaoh? That's where he was sent. Do you think that David could have burnt Saul? But David just cut a piece of his garment because he honored him. 
Some of us in this generation, we have lost honor. We don't even reverence God. We do what we want. And as soon as a power, we find, oh, you said this wrong. That's stuff that I don't agree with every person don't mean I leave. Because I'm going to deal with what I said. And I'll be like, I know I've said some stuff wrong. So who am I to judge? But some of us, we just love our pastors so much, love our preachers, we listen to them all the time, and we never go here. I'd rather people to go here and learn this and strip themselves away for at least a month or two, so that when they come back into it, we eat that cupcake, wow, that's too sweet. Back in the day, that tasted good. But this right here, I don't know. Don't discern the senses now. Man, I used to love them honey buns, bro. My sisters, man, I used to be on them honey buns like every day. But when I was detox off there, if I bite that, I haven't I'm scared of tasting that. But my, my sweet tooth has elevated to a to a more, more prestige place where you know the whole foods and stuff. But we work, we working. But I'm saying, but 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 when you win yourself off of something, you go back into it, you have a clear discernment then. But when you lost in that stuff, I can tell you the truth right now. You'd be like, well, no, my pastor's amazing. Like, whoa, you're too strong in this. You got to be at a place where you say, you know what? I love what my pastor offers. Listen, everybody on the best meals are the ones you cook out. Sunday is just you going out to eat. It's going out to eat. But that shouldn't be where you eat all the time. Imagine going to eat three times, a, a two, one time a week. Where would you be? Most of us, we are breast, we have been breastfed by men and women of God for so long that we don't even know how to rightly divide the word of truth from ourselves. The best way to enslave God's people is to keep God's people from reading the word themselves. So what do you do? You create a culture where I'm going to let the pastor tell you. I'm just going to read these little cliche verses, but I ain't really want to go deeper. Start off with a prayer of the day, a gospel of mine. Then God may lead you to Romans. You ain't going to go to Romans yet. You know, but Romans is pretty dense. Galatians and Ephesians are pretty dense. They're good chapters, good books. But until you know Jesus, you don't understand why, why he talks about the blood so much in Leviticus. And you really understand so much about well, who was Jesus in Exodus and in Genesis. You won't understand it because Jesus is the reason for the book. But when you start with the fundamentals, then you can grow into other stuff. Any more questions? We'll get out of here. Um, how do you deal with, like, I'll say, like, being like a Busybody. You know, sometimes you'll say, Oh, I'm gonna eat this word out, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna spend time with God, and then the next thing you know, it's like, Man, I'm gonna eat today. Or, you know, something like, <laughs> something like other things pop in your mind, you start going like cooking videos, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you start off like saying, I'm gonna spend this time with God. Like, you can be like, You have like a whole day long, okay, I'm gonna spend time with God. It's like all you, it's just like, it's like all you. It's little stuff don't mention, but how do you deal with that? Yeah, just know, it's, it just know it's not accidental. Mm -hmm. It's not accidental. Every time, man, that be sometimes like, today, <laughs> Lord, Father, I'm going to give you four hours of my time. Lord, I'm going to be on my knees yeah. for four hours. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to do it secretly. Because what you say out loud, mm -hmm. they want to be like, oh, you really want to pray? Mm -hmm. Okay, now mm -hmm. I'm going to go mess with her mom. I'm going to go talk to this person. They need to couch move over here. They caught them broke down yesterday. And that ain't right. It's just, all, it's just like, man, you got to know when to tell people, no, I'm going to spend this time with God. Even if you got to set up systems on top of systems on top of systems, it's a discipline. Like, people want emotional connection with God, but don't want the discipline that's needed for it to survive. Right? It is a discipline. You, when you want the, tell me. The reason why people don't follow God because they want to follow the feelings of Christianity, not the facts and the fundamentals of it. You just got to pray because I got to pray. I'm going to set this time aside, and it takes this, it takes saying, you know what? I'm going to charge my phone in another room. I'm going to do certain things to put this here. I'm going to put the Bible right up under my pillow. I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that if I cross past my Bible to pick up my phone, I'm going to see my heart that morning. If Saturday comes and I know I want to pray with God, I'm going to have to tell mama and everybody, no, come talk. Almost set, almost set a culture or a climate when it comes to you. So when people know, oh, her morning's gone. I ain't going to call her up because she don't pick up. You know what I'm saying? You, know saying? you got to create that. Cause I used to, I'm that nice guy. 
you be like, I'm Captain Save Them All. I'm like, okay, I'll be there. You be like, God, like, oh, well, we were supposed to. And sometimes I'm forgetful sometimes, and I'm getting over that. I forget, like, oh, man, because I know if I don't set systems, I know if I don't get sleep tonight, it's going to mess me up for my video that I want to do on Wednesday. If I don't do that video on Wednesday, I won't be able to do it. It's almost like I got to make my life so systematic that it causes effects that say, you know what, okay, this, okay, I can't do that next week. So when it comes to that phone call, what you do is, before you spend time with God, put that little moon thing on. So no calls and text messages come through. Put your phone downstairs. Um, just do little things that will make you not even be distracted. That's not easy, that's easier said than done. Yes? I, I, I struggle with that sometimes, that it's all of a sudden, like you said, just be aware that it's not, it's not just happenstance. Like it's, Happening purposely, it'll always. I'm a nanny, and so one once I put the child down to sleep, that's my time. I I'm I'm making it a discipline to take at least one of his three naps. He takes three naps. It's great. So now that means I have three different times where I can sit down and I can do the other chores that need to be done, laundry, bottles. But then one time I have to sit down and I have to be in my word. I have to make that discipline. It's always when you want to sit down and do that. All of a sudden, my mind, I swear, is like, oh, I'm supposed to text this person. I forgot to email this person back. Oh, I'm supposed to be um, studying this song for praise and worship. Like, all these things all of a sudden. And they're not necessarily bad things. Like, they're things I really need to do. So it's just coming against those things. That I can't, sometimes you can't, um, sorry, but you know, no, I can't put my phone downstairs. So I don't brush my teeth and wash my face first. I pick oh. up my phone first and I leave it in my bed before I get out. <laughs> then I don't so wash my face. I haven't you know, like, like, washed my, wash my face for teeth because when I, when I spend time with sometimes I just leave the house. Oh. Sometimes I get lost and you forget some things. But no, it's good. When you, know, when you know it's not accidental, you know that demons know you, then you'll know, okay, when this happens, I know I'm getting close to something. That even calls you like to sink into like depression when you feel like, oh man, I need to do all this stuff, but I'm supposed to do the. Oh man, listen, you know what gets me over condemnation? Hmm? You know what gets me over condemnation when I feel bad about not doing something? I'm like, look, man, I'm still his son. Yeah. I'm like, look, like, my bad guy, we're going to do it better tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When I, know, like, when I know I'm his son, like, I probably won't get this more until I have children. But when, but, but when, but when you know you're his son or you're his daughter, you're like, he ain't mad at me like that. He loves me. And he knew, like, what freed me was knowing he chose me with my future mistakes in mind. So you pursued me and you knew what was coming. Like, you know when you draft a player on your team, you know what comes with that person? It's like, oh, but God said, no, I got you because I know I'm going to get you out of this. But I don't feel bad. When I feel bad, I'm like, you know what? Hey, God, we're going to read right now. <laughs> you know, we're going to spend some time right now. And I don't really feel bad. I just use that, you know, I'm competitive. So I use, I channel in my sports, right? When I know, like, oh, a demon got a point on me today, okay. I got you, mom. I'm going to give you a double portion, mom. I'm get two chapters up on it, mom. I might get two books. You, know what I'm you get into that place where you're just like, you know what? Okay, this thing is a warfare for real. When you treat yourself like a civilian, you'll get messed up like a civilian. But when you know you're a soldier, you will act like one. When you know you are a soldier, you know they do not fight fair. And I've been warning every single one of y'all. When you pray for a person, you do ministry, you do anything to destroy the devil's work, they will retaliate. So, so many people that'll get out there and they'll be doing all this great ministry and don't know demons are like, oh, word. You're going to do that? We're going to stop you. That's why when you find it the hardest to break, I'm telling you, each and every one of us have a 30 second window to break that resistance. You got 30 seconds. And sometimes you got to be like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to get out my feelings in 24 seconds and I'm going to pray. Whenever you find the hardest to pray, that means someone or something needs you at that moment. Because this natural world is just a reflection of the spiritual world. You think this is everything? Man, if you got to the scales off your eyes, man, this room is more, there's more things in this room than us. And they're at your car leaning up against the line. I know you heard Coach Josh. I know you heard Josh. And I'm, you know, when you get in this car, I'm going to have your ex call you. If you want to talk, if you want to talk to your ex, you want to talk to something in your past, progress towards your future. 
they'll show up out of nowhere, you know, I was just thinking about you, hey, you know, you want to go to church on Sunday, yeah, I was thinking about, when you invited me to church three years ago, can I take you up on that offer now? <laughs> they come out of nowhere, and you know what, I never entertain what I know what demon is behind. When you know a demon's behind it, you laugh, because that person's heart is not with you for real. Their heart is not with you. So what you do is, <clears throat> oh, you like me again? That's a demonic attraction to you. They're demonically attracted to you for a moment to get you lured in. And then once you done gave them the section of slap with him, a slap where all of a sudden that person look you in the eyes, they become a different person. Oh, so yeah, um, got to catch a plane tomorrow. It was cool. We had a great time. And now you lost in all this condemnation. I sinned against God. And I got played as a fool. You better know these demons know you better than you know yourself. They got lust. They got temptations tailored to you. They know exactly how to make you fall. That's why when you know God and know yourself, you'll be more aware of how demons attack you. And when those girls be in your DMs and trying to talk to you and those gentlemen be coming at you, you be like, you don't really like me for me. You just trying to steal my anointing. You trying to mess up with God or Daniel for me. Like when you know that, you laugh at that stuff. You don't get caught up on that's why you can't make it in this world if you're insecure. If you're insecure, you're not going to really last in this Christian walk. Because them demons pray on your insecurity. Man, whatever you don't like about yourself that you cannot change, own it. Man, I, you heard this joke before. I got a really big head. You know what I'm saying? I got an African side, forehead, extended cap. This thing is huge. When I owned it, you can call me, you can say big head jokes all day, it don't affect me. Because I own them. If whatever you don't own, them demons will use against you. All of a sudden, you walk around in security. I don't really think I'm cute. I don't think I'm purity. I'm not the redeemed of God. I'm not really, God don't love me. Oh, they love that climate in your heart. Because all they got to do is bring another Larry, another Thomas, another Chelsea, another Martha in your life, and you right back in that cycle again. You got to know yourself. <clears throat> You guys to be like, you know what, I'm insecure about this. And if I don't own this right now, that man you thought was a man of God, just because he's down there jumping around worshiping, you don't judge a man what you do on Sunday. Maybe they be lying or they worship. Anyway, you got to answer? I didn't, but um, what happens, what would you suggest for any, any person that falls, you know, like you're a soldier on the field? There, there, there are going to be times when you fall down. How do you suggest they get back up? Because not many people can like, oh, I'm up. And again, some people, it takes a lot for them to get back up. For me, I personally have experience where, you know, where I was on the path and, you know, I was doing so good. And then here comes Larry. And then I fall off the path. And it takes me forever to get back to that place and say, hey, I'm still God's own. You know, it takes months or years for some people. They fall into a better depression. They feel like they're not good enough to be in God's kingdom. So, what do you say? What, 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 the, the root of mental illness, certain mental illnesses, and the root of depression, mm -hmm. and the root of a lot of these different things are lack of clarity. Yeah. When I don't know, whatever I don't know will be used against me. <clears throat> so, the gap between when you fall and rise is predicated on how much you really believe what this book says about you. So when I make a mistake with God, I know that nothing can take me out of his hand. I am justified as a son or a daughter to God. That there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. That I am called and chosen. I, I am his. So when I make a mistake and I feel that remorse, I go repentance is a gift. Repentance ain't no, ain't no burden. It's a gift like, Father God, hey, I'm sorry. Help me to be done with this. Help me to overcome this. Because when you begin to deepen your reverence for him, your actions begin to change. Whatever you don't reverence, your actions become unlimited towards. If I don't respect women, my actions towards women are not limited. It's unlimited. You start swinging, you start hitting, you start cheating, you start messing around. But when you reverence someone, your actions towards them are different. Even when you offend them, that person that you offended's love is what's going to bring you back up. So when I know that I hurt someone that deeply loves me and has chosen me, 
What got me through a lot of stuff was the fact that he loves me, that he chose me, that his love is not man's love, that's fickle and fairy tale like. His love, yo, God, you chose me, which means when I repent, I'm back where I need to be. I'm in right standing, period. So when I make a mistake, okay, God, okay, my mind goes into what caused it, what did I allow in my life, God help me to patch up those areas. So I, you know what gets me going to? I got work to get done. I don't got time to be depressed for three weeks. Three weeks cost me time. This book has to be out by March. If this book ain't out by March, then I'm not walking in obedience. So which means is I don't got time to be condemning myself and being caught up in this cloud. I got work to do for the fuck. So God, we good? We good? Okay, make me better. Okay, I'm going to make my adjustments so I won't fall again. And you keep it moving. When you're, when you have nothing to work on, and your reverence is not, is not really there, and you don't know who God is to you and who you are to Him, condemnation will last two, three weeks, four months, five months. Some people they're still in it. It's been five years. Yeah. But when you do not know that you are forgiven, that you are chosen, that you that that He that that nothing can like like when you know that you his son and daughter, man. When I have a kid, when we have kids, that's that's an answer. That's nasty. Ain't nothing going to change it. That kid at 16, whatever can do, but that's still my son. Nothing can take that child away. And when you know you're a son or daughter, and you know no devil help can take you away, I know we got work to do. My bad. I'm going a, I'm to a deepen my reverence. But if you don't have a regimen of being this word and falling in love with him, spending time, Engage with him, man, you ain't gonna reference. I'm not saying you, I'm saying it built the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. My level of reference will determine the level of wisdom I walk in. If you want to be more wise, deepen your reverence. If you want to deepen your reverence, spend more time with him. Because man, I can't hurt her. She's too good to me. I can't. I reverence her. There's a there's a biblical <coughs> divine reverence. When it comes to ministry, that's a divine reverence. When it comes to God, that's a divine reverence. Reverence is what keeps me. The fear of God is what keeps me walking in wisdom. And if I don't have that reverence, and you start hearing Josh did this, Josh did that, you know I walked away from this. But if you stay close to this, and you stay true to his word, and you stay true to him, man, when you fall, you're like, I'm back up because, look, I don't got time. We, me and God, we good. We got stuff we got to do. Yes. Can I add Yes, please. Okay. Um, also, too, uh, something that I've learned uh, from experience is having that one friend that you can always call. Um, I can't speak from the male experience from, you know, uh, from the male point of view, but from the female point of view, having that one female friend that you can always uh, call on that's Christian, um, who has your same beliefs and who's not going to judge you, who you can say, girl, I fell, I did this, I did that, but then she can turn around in that same moment and can uplift you and can give you that word of advice and can also direct you to say, well, get in your word, get in your worship, you know, fall on your knees and when you wake up in the morning, it's a new day. So when you have that one friend that can be in your corner like that, it makes all the difference in the world because I used to be the type to have like a ton of friend girls around me and just, I thought everybody was my friend, but then in those moments where I would fall, I realized that I had two different types of friends. The ones who would agree that what I did was okay and it was okay to stay in depression, but then I had those other friends who were wanting to lift me up. So uh, just from experience, um, I shortened my list of friends to now down to like a good two or three friends who I can, who I can call on, who can always keep me surrounded. So outside of the spiritual things of what I said, I would also um, suggest just you know, see, you know, asking God to show you who your uh, real friend girls are so you can, um, in those moments, have somebody that can um, give you that extra boost of encouragement. That's real. Because there's two types of people that's around people. Vults and vultures. You need people who are vults. A lot of us are surrounded with people that are only trying to eat off of us. They're vultures. They'll take what you say and give it to somebody else. We all need that accountability. Look at Jesus, man. He went, he had 5,000 plus. 5,000, then he had 77, then he had 12, then he had three, then he had himself and God, right? Those are the layers of people you're going to always engage with. You got the 5,000 people, you got a YouTube channel, you got whatever, you, you, you got a bunch of people that just love you for the, for the, for the fish place, right? 
Then you got the seven, seven something people, right? Those are the people that's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help support whatever you do. Then you got the 12, those are your real disciples, but be careful because one of them is a Jew. But even Jesus brought it all the way down to three. When he went to the mountain of transfiguration, he only brought three. There's only three, there's only, you only have about two or three friends where you can really transfigure in front of. Really show yourself. If he, if he really showed himself to the 12, to the 70, to the 5,000, it wouldn't have worked. So having and knowing who that vault is, those people that where you can confess sin, who creates a culture where when you confess something, they don't scare them off, that is a great support system to have. Those kind of counsel is very important, um, but make sure those are hand-selected. Because people we bring in our lives, they just there for the dead stuff. They just want to eat off the dead stuff and don't really help you in the process. Time for one more question. We get you guys home. Everybody good? What's the third Thursday? Third Thursday is um, November um, 17th. Thank you. Thanks, Thanksgiving. The fourth Thursday. The fourth Thursday. Well, we'll be back here on the third Thursday. Starting at um, 6.45, we're going to join us for the rest of this. The video will be up today. Um, wasn't able to finish everything because I really wanted to answer you guys' questions, but I do have an activity for you guys. I'll uh, probably do this same message again um, next time. Uh, as far as other points, all right, your life work. I got a four, five-week plan for you on how um, to determine what caused it. What caused it? Take some time to list all of your present effects and causes and list beside them their potential cause and effects. And utilize the monthly plan to help you stay on top of your causes and effects. So basically, in the first activity, I want you to write down all your present effects. Effects are things that are manifested from an action. Like, I got this illness, or I got this uh, depression. I got these effects in my life, good or bad. And I want you to write down a potential cause. I wasn't able to get to, uh, yeah, the cultural, personal, carnal, abnormal, all those kind of causes. So if you have an effect, like, man, I, I'm dealing with depression right now. I want you to take some time and say, what were the potential causes that got you to that place of depression? Because every cause, have, every effect has a cause. Also, I want you to write down what is the current causes, things that you could be practicing right now that could produce potential effects. Like, what are you practicing right now that could bring a negative effect in your life in the future? After that, I want you to list all the negative causes and effects from above, below, and right beside the inscription of ways to reverse those causes and effects. Whatever negative effects are causing your life, I want you to write those things down. Like, hey, Josh, I emotionally eat. But you don't not to. We do an additional exercise. Like, hey, I, I emotionally eat. Or I, I'm dealing with depression. Or I'm with the guy he's supposed to be with. Um, I'm in an abusive relationship. Um, um, I'm struggling with diabetes. Whatever it is. Say, I'm going to list those negative effects and I'm going to find scriptures and practical ways to reverse those causes. Right? The next part is the four or five week plan. That's what I want you to do is for each day, like week one, there are some questions I want you to ask yourself. Monday through Tuesday, I want you to write down the positive effects of what caused them. What are some positive things that happened in your life and what caused them? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, through Sunday. What are the negative effects of what caused them? What are some things that happened? You slap somebody, slap you back, okay, man, I got slapped. So that was a negative fact. I'm going to slap. I'm not slap nobody else again. <laughs> negative effects reversed, yes or no? How did you reverse those negative effects? Did you or did you not? And ways to improve. I especially just want you for the next four weeks to really just be conscious of what happens in your day. Then you'll know, okay, I'm tired. I'm usually tired on Tuesdays and Wednesdays because I watch this show until 11 o'clock at night. That's a call, that's an effect. If I just go to bed early, I'll be more productive. If I cut this out of my life, I get to bed at a certain time and that makes me more productive throughout my week. That's just basically being conscious and okay, what am I doing that's causing negative effects that constantly happen in my life? When you are, when you become aware of those things, you're like, man, I'm really, I gotta cut this out of my diet, my spiritual diet, emotional, mental, physical diet. I gotta cut this out of my life because it's really affecting how I'm handling with my wife, my kids, or handling with money. Or it, it just starts, starts affecting things. And then you can have support systems say, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna cut this out of my life because when I do, Life is better. Hey, we need sleep. We need to eat right. We need spiritual support. But there's a lot of things that's congesting these time frames keeping us from being effective. Does that make sense?
take some time, process, because I want you guys to see just how much the spiritual world affects our lives and the things that we practice really affect our lives, keeping us from going deeper with God, keeping us from being more loving, kind, etc. Everybody, all hearts and minds good? We good? Every third Thursday, every first time we meet here, man, we would love. Any first time guests? That's the first time you're here. First time guests, raise your hand. Let's give it up for them.